Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are here with the TL2D team and a special guest who I'll introduce in just a second. And we're talking about uh, speeding on public roads. Um, you've met Megan, you've met Jessica, and Cordell is new, even though his name is spelled oddly on the screen. His name is Cordell, and he looks like a ghostly apparition, but I assure you here he's here in body and soul. And Cordell, maybe introduce yourself a bit. Hi, my name is Cordell, and this is my first year with the TL2D team. Um, I am the event planner this summer. I have researched and curated blog posts, spreadsheets, and lists, and I've helped launch and uh, create social media campaigns, working with the team. Um, it's been really awesome, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you too. And now I'm going to introduce our special guest. And I got to read a little bit of this because I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, I met Andy years ago at an event called Lifesavers, and it's all about road safety. And he was there as a speaker. And he is a fascinating guy. He's a racer um, and a really winning racer, an educator and a journalist. Um, he's a professional racer, race car driver with over 30 years of experience. Um, has won five championships and 81 races so far. Clearly, he's still racing. And uh, tests and analyzes a lot of uh, not only production vehicles, but race cars on the track. And uh, reviews and hosts of various events, which is why he's right now in Kentucky and uh, working with Corvettes, which is very cool. Um, he also has a foundation um, called the Traffic Safety Education Foundation and provides, does a lot of videos for um, teenagers and parents about safe driving. And it's far more complicated than most people realize. So welcome, Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Appreciate it. And today we're talking, as I mentioned, Andy is a race car driver and tests vehicles on tracks. So he has a lot of experience on tracks. And um, Andy, how would you compare driving at extreme speed on the track versus on public roads? That's almost like saying, could you construct a nuclear power plant while we're on this podcast? To be honest, it's complicated. It's very complicated, but let me try and simplify it because that's the most important thing. On a racetrack, we're basically going the same direction. On a racetrack, you don't have children, pedestrians, trucks, anything pulling out of front of you. You generally don't have a sudden stop that can happen. And even though you do have blind corners, we actually don't, we do have people called corner workers who signal to us if something has happened on the other side of the blind corner. So in other words, and we have medical people standing by, all the rest of it. Racetracks are designed for the running of a race car as fast as it can possibly go. They are race cars, they are prepared with special brakes, they have special tires for the most part, and they also have a lot of safety equipment in it. So there's a safety aspect, are so huge. We wear helmets, we wear fireproof suits, and we're actually there to ex do exactly what we're supposed to do. We're not on prescription medication, we're not on legal or illegal drugs, we are all tested for those things, and we are basically there with the same intent uh, to race, try to win, but have a good, good competition. When you're on the street, the biggest problem with fast driving, and, and in, a, in a cynical way, a, an engineer will always tell you it's not the speed that injures you or worse, it is the sudden stops or the sudden changes of directions when somebody hits something. The, the thing that I've found from talking to young people, um, inexperienced people that are learning the first five years to me, you are still a learning, very much a learning driver. The biggest um, thing to take away from why speed is a problem on the street is that the time it takes to react and the time it takes to slow down to a safe speed, if you are speeding, is too long. By the time somebody starts to pull out in front of you when you're doing 30 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone, you have designs that engineers looked at, the streets, construction of streets, everything else, and they say at 30 miles an hour, you have a fair chance to see the junction, 
to see someone who might start to pull out and you have a fair chance from that speed to stop or significantly reduce speed. So if there is an impact, it's, it's a survivable impact, even with a pedestrian. When we're doing, and I obviously the, the uh, PSA that I made for you guys uh, and Canada as a whole, and now the whole of the US with speeding and uh, stunting on roads, we talk about break distances and we talk about reaction times in there. And when you're doing 100 kph in a place where you're supposed to be doing 50, the distances are not really readily understood. You can see the person pulling out in front of you, potentially. Hopefully, they can see you. Sometimes they cannot because you're too far back. You might be able to see them. When they start to pull out in front of you at the bigger speeds, you just don't have the time to see, process, and react and break. And it's really when you're speeding gratuitously, you're taking away your chance to react. You cannot react and you certainly can't stop. And the faster you go, the worse it is. Physics, just physics never quits. You might be a second or two away from impact, but it's over. And it's just uh, from people I've spoken to that have been in those positions, um, it, it's, it's the worst feeling in the world because you know, you know that uh, that thing that you didn't think would happen has happened. And, the risk processing comes down to it as well, Anne-Marie. When we're younger, we don't process the risk as well because parts of our brain have not developed sufficiently to process. And that's not talking down to an inexperienced person. That's just a pure physiological fact that our brains don't really finish, in, finish developing in those risk assessment areas until sometimes we're like 26, 27 years old. And so there's a lot goes to it, but essentially don't give up that opportunity to stop and that's what speed takes away that's absolutely true and according to uh some of the research that we did <laughs> at 20 miles per hour which is 32 kilometers an hour if you hit a pedestrian one um in 10 will die okay increase by 10 miles per hour only 10 miles per hour to 50 kilometers an hour five in 10 will die but increase to 65 kilometers an hour, which is 40 miles per hour, nine in 10 will die. And, and, the, and again, that's physics. It's, um, it doesn't matter how alert you are at that point, if you hit them, that's the impact of that collision. Speed kills, as they say. Um, I notice that there is a huge increase since the beginning of COVID in extreme speed, especially on highways, but not, not solely. Even in communities here, I've seen and read of people driving at 70, 80 kilometers an hour when the speed limit is 30. But on highways, we've had young people, one um, G2 driver, which is a, a restricted license here, um, driving at 308 kilometers an hour on a public highway. That was at the beginning of COVID on the uh, QEW. And uh, the police pulled him over. He did pull over. And um, they were clapping as they stopped that vehicle. But people on the road were terrified. All it takes is somebody changing lanes. And as you said earlier, Andy, when they're going that fast, it's very hard to see them. You can be checking your mirrors, but they come up so fast that you don't get a chance yes. to see them. Mm -hmm. And you're doing everything right. You signal your lane change, you go to pull over and it's over for everybody yep. at that speed. And, oh and, yeah, that's, that's really quick. Yeah. Oh, it is. And on a public road. I mean, that never happened before. Um, that started happening during COVID because the traffic was reduced. Sadly, that has continued. That did not stop once people started driving again. Um, have you noticed that on public roads, Andy? Um, yeah, to a degree, to a degree, the traffic is sort of back to post, you know, uh, pre-COVID levels in most places. Um, there seem to be a lot of people that are recklessly speeding. When I say that, changing lanes, going through traffic, splitting holes, taking to the hard shoulder when somebody does a lane change, not even attempting to slow down. When you're over the speed limit by significant amount, you are over the edge. You are rolling the dice. It's roulette. It's gambling with other people's lives. 
And I do not blame the authorities for being extraordinarily upset when they stop someone who is gratuitously, excessively speeding because they've been the ones, and I've worked with a lot of people in the Broward County Sheriff's Office uh, down in South Florida over the years, they get upset because they're the ones who've had to clean up the messes from these things. And yeah. nothing worse for these officers than children in vehicles. Right. Um, there's a chill child involved, things like this and these stories. I understand it's very hard to take these kinds of stories, the hard luck stories, the tragic stories, and actually utilize them. It's not the best way to get to young people. But please understand, that's why the authorities get upset. It's just, it's just not worth it. Get to, a, get to a place where you can do it. Go to a, a, an organized event, whatever that event might be, whether it's drifting, whether it's drag racing, there are places to go that usually aren't that far away. And, and when you're going excessively quick, a whole number of things change with your car that you may have no idea about until you start going really fast. And it's like the steering wheel movement that is completely okay at 30 miles an hour if you make the same rate of change oh yeah but 30 and now you're doing 100 that same rate will cause the tires to one hook and then you're in a big slide you may or may not be able to control it but that's why cars just get out of control and people watching some of these videos they go what, what, what happened to that guy he made a steering wheel move and the car just started sliding look what happened this is what happened it's not easy to drive at very high speeds, especially in production cars. They're not designed for it. Many, most production cars, especially SUVs, they create lift. The faster they go, they create lift, meaning the air to the car, under the car, and over the car. It doesn't produce downforce. It produces lift. Many cars years ago used to be absolutely unstable at over 100 miles an hour because of lift. They're, now, they're, lift means they lose traction. They're actually off the ground. Lift means there is actually force like a wing, like a wing on a plane, right? As the plane goes, you put flaps up, the air underneath the wing creates more power and lift. So the plane just goes up. It's just, again, pure physics. When you're going over 100 miles an hour or 180K, you will be causing lift in most vehicles. And a lot of these cars aren't they don't carry aerodynamics race cars have aerodynamics to keep them stable at high speeds these things just aren't thought about and so the first time you actually oh we're doing 100 miles an hour we're doing 180k and then they come to a corner in the freeway which isn't a corner at 60k or 80k suddenly that same corner at 180 they just stay around the corner the car loses traction it's the it's the misunderstanding the inexperience that puts these younger drivers for sure that have decided somebody in the car may have said oh let's see how fast it'll go i remember those times but be the person that says guys i'm not doing it don't be the one that takes that car to the limit there are too many high speed crashes with young people at that one time that they said okay let's see what it'll do there's not much traffic and they think that what can possibly go wrong? The turn in the freeway that's fine at 80K, at 180K, or even 160K suddenly becomes a problem. And that's where, sadly and tragically, things really go pear-shaped. Uh, so there's so many aspects to this. When speed is involved, there are so many aspects that come into play that a young and experienced driver just doesn't think about. I feel like misunderstanding is such a big part in this and especially trying to reach young people because not only do they see the people around them and they're encouraged by peers um, and just other people on the road, but then you have movies like Fast and Furious and you become, everything becomes very romanticized and you want to be able to take part in this. But what they don't understand is being somebody, being Vin Diesel in Fast and Furious is not the same as driving in your community. It's it's just not. Or even, for example, you as a race driver, you know, you explained a lot about the behind the scenes, how you have the people like the corner individuals. I'm not sure what the terminology you used was, but the there's a lot of behind the scenes. <laughs> you had the corners, um, you had, you know, a fire. Um, what am I, what's the, the word? Suit. 
Buy a buy suit. Suit. There, there we go. Mm-hmm. You know, you mm-hmm. have these things that a lot of people don't understand. And even he, he, you're, you're talking here and I'm like, oh, wow, like I didn't know that. Or, oh, wow, there's a lot that actually goes into the behind the scenes. So when you're a young individual who's not exposed to those things, then you think, oh, wow, I want to drive fast too. But unfortunately, you're just, it's not the same ballpark. I'm just going to butt in for one second. Vin Diesel does not drive those vehicles. Those are stunt drivers. They are not on public roads. They have uh, emergency crews on standby. Everything is choreographed. They're all professional drivers. Everything is timed. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, you have this image of these guys driving. And because we work with stunt drivers too, and they'll tell us, well, no, we actually did that sequence at 50 kilometers an hour on slow speed film and then speed it up. There are lots of tricks to make it look like it really exciting, but it is not just somebody jumping in a car and, and taking off on a public street. And that's not what anybody sees. You don't see the behind the scenes. No one's searching up, oh, how did they actually film the scene in Fast and Furious 7? Like they're they're not doing that. They see it in the movie theater and they think, wow, I want to do that too. And that's for sure not everybody, but all it takes is one individual in a group of peers to easily influence everybody else. And and you're completely right, Andy, where, you know, nobody wants to be that one individual to Mm -hmm. stick up, but it's very important where if you do feel unsafe, you do feel uncomfortable to say something and put a stop to it. Yes, it it, it absolutely is. And and your observations are are entirely correct, Uh, especially about the movie. Actually, one of the, my teammates was actually one of the stunt drivers on Fast and Furious. He was all made up to look like one of the characters and he did the driving. So Anne Marie, you are completely correct. <laughs> yeah, one of the stunt drivers we work with is actually uh, he was on. He's done a couple of Fast and Furious. I know he was on Nine for sure. Um, that's the one that they did in Iceland. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, completely different. I mean, they built a whole town there for these things. I'm actually a member of the Screen Actors Guild since 2004, and I have done some of those stunts. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes the cars are modified. They're not no, the same. No, car. not the sometimes. Most of the time, they have to be. They have safety equipment in, and basically, they they green screen a different uh, car completely when they show the interior of the car. But the inside of the car is is a safer vehicle with crash bars and everything else. Yes, true, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So people are who are trying to emulate those movies are trying to emulate something that's not real. Well, we're in the time of reality TV, so there's no surprise. That- <laughs> it's true. I if was going to say it must be real. Yeah. yeah. I, I was going to say maybe a takeaway for young people is like if you have whatever you want to call it a need for speed, if you're an adrenaline junkie, if that's something you want to experience, like Andy said, there are places to do that so like what kind of places would those be like what would they be be called and like what kind of things well, could there are have? tracks there are like tracks where they have nights that amateurs can drive mm-hmm. there are also uh, yeah. schools yeah every every drag strip drag strip is the straight line racing quarter mile racing very you know a lot of uh, people like that it's a uh, high horsepower and it's straight line um it, the drag strips have what they call test and tune nights And literally for $10, you can go and take your car and make two or three runs in an evening. It's a very social atmosphere. And there are safety people on standby there. You have to have a helmet. And that's about it. You know, a lot of times, if your car's not too fast, uh, you can actually go have fun and put it on a track. There are places called um, uh, the Sports Car Club of America and the associated type of uh, group in Canada. They have what they call autocross events. And if you've got a 1986 Toyota Corolla and you want to go to an autocross, there is a class for your car, your type of car. And even though it may, you may think that's not a race car. Well, it's not a race. It's you against the clock. They usually set up in a parking lot with a bunch of cones and they set up a course. It's timed and it's official and you get a class and you're running against a bunch of other, you know, slower vehicles and with less horsepower. And you can actually compete and it's in a parking lot and you wear a helmet and that's about all you need. And yeah, you'll wear your tires out after a while, but you only get maybe five or six runs in a whole day and you're not going to destroy your tires and you can enjoy yourself, have fun and just learn to drive your car better in that kind of environment. And normally there are a lot of older guys, experts, uh, older people, male, female, doesn't matter, 
older people there that are more than happy to impart information to you to help you make your car a little more stable or help you with your driving style or give you an understanding of how it works. It's a very, there's many areas. Those two, the drag racing and the autocross doesn't cost anything. When I, you know, it just doesn't cost any money. You don't have to modify your car or anything. You just say, oh, I do autocross with this car. You know, it, it's, uh, there's many places to go. It's um, romanticized is what I think Jessica used the word. And that's, that's the thing. It's like if it's Saturday night at 2 a.m. and it's in the middle of nowhere and we're having a street race, it's, it's, it's becomes, you know, it becomes like a auto rave. I mean, it's like a thing. Everybody's there and you've got to be there. And I understand that. But again, it only goes wrong once for so many people when it comes to speed and that's it. And they can't take it back. And that's the problem. And I, I have spoken to so many young people um, that are permanently damaged. Some of them are in, um, in, incarcerated. Um, and they've spoken to me, being a traffic safety person over the many years. And that's the thing. It's like, if only I could have taken it back. If only I could go back. I, they, they've never in any way, shape, or form meant to hurt anybody. But it's like they just couldn't, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. It's like, I understand. I understand. And they can see the second or two before impact that they were trying their hardest yeah. up and couldn't. And they'll never get that out of their heads. And that's unfortunately the downside of speeding on a public road. Unfortunately, it's those kind of circumstances where it's the, I don't think it's going to happen to me. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But unfortunately it takes an incident like that for you and the people around you to get it through their head. And what we're yeah. saying is not necessarily to eliminate the whole need for speed. It's just, there's a mm -hmm. time and there's a place. And unfortunately, and it, you know, it's not on the public road. It's not on the highway. It's in an organized event where there is safety equipment. There is you know, there's a space for that. And maybe that's something also that's misunderstood by young people that, oh, there is a place that I can go do this. There is somewhere I can go fulfill this need, mm -hmm. but it is in mm -hmm. a safe environment that doesn't have pedestrians, doesn't have cyclists, or doesn't have other cars on the road. Absolutely. It's, um, it's not just you. It, and just being able to maneuver. I mean, I've heard that, oh, you know, I can handle it. I can handle my car. It physics doesn't lie. And, uh, you know, you want to see if you can really handle it, take it to a track. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it may not be convenient. Uh, I do understand that when you've got groups of young people, decisions are going to be made, but uh, just be, try and be that person that backs out of it. You know, if you're at a traffic light and, you know, the guy next to you is a friend or, or somebody that you want to suddenly race or they want to race you, I get it. If it's a 40 mile an hour zone or a 50 mile, you know, an 80, 80 K zone and you decide like, there's no one around, we can just go. Just understand that you have to back off at the speed limit. I mean, just somebody make a good decision because I understand it. I'm a racer. I wanted to race since I was probably three years old. My family was nothing to do with racing. They thought I was from Mars. But I mean, I just had an interesting cause. They didn't know why. My father had no interesting cause whatsoever. Um, but I, I just always was fascinated with anything with an engine and wheels. And I truly understand it. But there's just so much hurt and so much unnecessary that's come out of bad decisions, uh, the, the poor decisions. Um, unthoughtless decisions and quick decisions. Just take your time, whether it's pulling out of a junction, don't do the glance and go, because if you have a car coming that is not doing the speed limit, you put yourself in harm's way. So there's two sides to it too. Right. And you come to a junction and you're going to pull out, make sure that you look at the very last split second, make sure you glance in the direction that you're going to pull out and, you know, left or right, depending on which side of the road you drive, that the bottom line is make sure that last glance is the last look. You've already processed there's nothing coming, but that last quit just to make sure that there's nobody speeding coming, because then you put yourself in the middle of it. You can always say the person was speeding, but why would you want to get in their way? if you could have seen them coming. And many exactly. times 
the crash, there's, there is responsibility on both sides. But the point is, both sides need to pay more attention. Both sides need to do a better job of figuring out what's going on. Because reality is, speeding drivers are out there. No matter how much training is done, no matter how much we talk about this, they will be out there. And you just don't want to meet them because it's going to be violent. And that's it. So also the responsibility is on the people that pull out. You have to not, I'm just saying, pull out the red light runners. Going through a green light at a traffic signal, the red light runners are everywhere. Look for them. Make sure you see them coming. I have missed red light runners so many times in my life. As a motorcycle rider, I love to ride motorcycles on the street. You have to be more defensive and aware on two wheels, obviously, but um, you can miss so many of these impacts if you just pay more attention. Unfortunately, the phones, uh, the uh, hands-free calls, whatever they are, all of that type of stuff with the, with the smartphones associated with smartphones is, is a dreadful distraction for everybody, whether you're the speeder or whether you're the person just pulls out in front of people. It's just, uh, we all have to drive with a lot more care and attention. I just wanted to add to that. I have a story. Um, I've noticed a lot in the headlines in Toronto, uh, not pedestrians, bicyclists are actually like revolting and they're getting angry at police officers because they're being clamped down on. But I will never forget this one time I was biking down Dixie and um, I was biking down a sloped area and there was very tall grass to the left of me and um, a car pulls up and this is happening. This is happening too often, I'd say, but they pull up, they pull up right before they make the turn to, to join into the lane, the right turn. They look left. They don't look right to see if anyone's coming. Again, they can't see anyone if anyone would be able to come because of the tall grass. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they just drive. And this guy was with his family, his two kids, his wife. It looked like he was very heated. He pulled up really fast, way faster than the speed limit. And then he just looked left, didn't even look right, and then pulled. Like, he, he literally almost ran into me. It was so unsafe. I'll never yes. forget it. Yeah. It was on me. It was on me. I could have I could have gotten into the collision. But because I obviously slowed down, knowing that there was a blind spot, I didn't get mm -hmm. hit that day. But well, good for you. Good, good for you. Heads up. Just to be clear, for the driver who's pulling into an intersection, the light is turns green. Before you start moving, you need to, to look to the left, to the center ahead of you, to the right, back to the left. And then if there's nothing coming, you can start your move. If you're making a right turn, same thing, left, center, right, left, mm -hmm. right mirror check. And make mm -hmm. sure there's not a cyclist coming up next to you. But uh, we really need to learn to scan roads properly. Absolutely. The, the first thing that we do on the racetrack, which is something that is actually quite useful on the street, is when you see brake lights in front of you, sort of unexpectedly, people, they ask, what is the, what is the first thing you do? Check your rear view mirror. It's not slam on the brakes. Also, yes, you may have to do that. If you're too close, you may have to do that. But in the sense of before you ever hit brakes on a freeway, if you know, traffic slowing down ahead, you have to check your review mirror just to make sure there's no big 18 wheel truck or something right behind you. Because if you hit the brakes, he cannot stop. And braking distances are something else that, that I put in the video for you, Anne-Marie, because yes. the understanding of a pickup truck average stopping distance from, um, you know, like 90K is 50 feet further than the average smaller sports car, uh, like 150 feet as opposed to 100 feet or even better in the case of some really, really good sports cars, you can get down to 80, 85 feet. I mean, that's a remarkably different. I mean, you're talking four or five car lengths difference from, the, from a speed of about 60 to 90K. It's... These kinds of things, just people just don't think about. The people, inexperienced drivers that pull in front of an 18-wheel truck on a three-lane road in a sort of more built-up area, and they'll pull in front of the truck, hit the brakes, no signal, and then turn right, and the 18-wheel truck's locking up all the wheels not to hit them. That's just pure ignorance that you do that, and it's like we try, all the educators try to talk about those kinds of things, 
but it's again it just puts you at massive risk not because the truck was was speeding necessarily at all but because he can't he's going to take 300 feet to stop in the difference you can stop from 100 in in 100 feet that's a massive massive difference well i can't tell you how many times i have seen somebody driving in the center lane um in, in which is the faster lane and all of a sudden on the highway, oh, there's my exit, bang, across oh. four lanes of traffic. And yes. every time I see that, I think, oh my God, thank God they made it. Because the chances of making it without looking, crossing four or five lanes, we um, in Canada here, the 401 is the busiest highway in the world, in, in North America. And I know it, it will. Has, I know it oh, will. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's a different highway to drive because you are drive from the core to the collectors when you're going to be getting off. I mean, it's a little That's bit right. different, right. but you have to be paying attention, watching your exit, knowing, you know, when you're going to get off. But the number of times I have seen people zoom across like that, and it just, it scares the heck out of me every single time. It should. It should. <laughs> I notice that a lot with when the lane is ending and everyone wants to speed up to go around and wait until the last possible second that they absolutely can to speed in and where there's no more space and to cut in. And I've also noticed it a lot with the HOV lanes. Um, when you're talking about somebody missing their exit, they exit from the HOV lane where they're not supposed to and speed over to their exit. And it's I, people don't understand all the risks that come into doing something like that. And it, it, it honestly, it blows my mind. Andy, do you support the zipper merge? Like one, then the other, then the other, like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, do I support it? Yes, if, if everybody's doing the same thing, going the same direction and has the same idea and understands how to do it, of course, it should work that way. I do that. Yes, I do that. I mean, if I'm sort of in a position where there were two cars, one gets in, in, in front of the person in front, the next guy goes, I will be the person that lets that one in, even though I kind of had to slow down a little bit and, the, and they get it and they'll move in there a lot of times. But sometimes some people just get paralyzed and just they stop. And so until everybody stops and then like waits and then they say, oh, good, they're letting me go. But oh, my goodness, it's like just learn how to drive, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I just figured that's all I can do. Just produce materials that if discussed in the classroom can open some eyes and help these uh, people be safer out there. That's all I can do because trying to change laws is, um, it's not what I'm going to do. It's not what I'm going to do. I, I prefer to just do something and get the stuff out there. It doesn't cost anything um, in the sense that none of my stuff costs anything. Uh, if you want videos, you want 500 DVDs. If I've got them, it's free. I'll pay for shipping and handling. It's out there. Uh, that was the whole point of setting up the foundation. It, for me, is to just give stuff away, give all the information I have. If you think it's worthwhile, great, use it. Uh, but that's what we need. We need more education. This, this, what you guys are doing is wonderful. Young people, it's in critically important that young people get involved in the process. So uh, hats off to all of you for doing this and to you, Anne-Marie because this is what young people need. Um, somebody like myself, sure, I have experience. I can reach a certain number of people, but equally important to have younger people uh, who, who have these kinds of voices that you guys obviously do. It's really great. Well, thanks very much. And we agree in Ontario, 62% of new drivers do not take driver education. So it's, we are not headed in a good direction. But I'm realistic enough to know that I'm not going to change the laws. So well, you and I, you and I have batted our heads against Washington type politics for long enough to know that that's not where we can be. And we don't, I mean, certainly me, I don't have the millions of dollars to get lobbyists to do things. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I absolutely know what you mean. <laughs> it's yeah. a tough haul. But, education, uh, it, just education, try education, to educate, education. And keep talking about it and, and yes. talk about making good decisions and mm -hmm. what good decisions look like and, and skills. I mean, I don't know how many times that I've, I've got my license, you know, it's okay. I got my license. You got your license for the 20 minutes when you are the most focused you will ever be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is it really all the license is is um, an okay to continue learning on roads. 
it is not the pinnacle of you know everything there is to know. And I think we need to kind of change our mindset around that. It's not the end. I the couldn't, license couldn't agree is more. not the end. Yeah. No. Oh, gosh. No, the license is not. It's, it's the very beginning. I agree. I agree. Things are always changing. Uh, yes. There are new distractions. There are roundabouts. There are double left turn lanes. There are different types of signaling. You have to be continually learning. Absolutely, 100%, 100%, yeah. So what about you guys? What do you think? Any comments? What Have you, have you learned anything? Megan, what did you learn? <laughs> uh, well, I was going to say, I, I think we could tie in um, because we've done a few podcasts about like impaired driving, distracted driving, uh, stuff like that. And one thing that we touched on in those podcasts was like, if you get yourself in a situation where maybe you don't realize that the driver is impaired until you're in the car, I kind of see like a similarity there. Like if you, um, for young people, like if you get yourself in a situation where you're in a car with a bunch of people, probably young people, and the driver decides, you know, like Andy said, let's see how fast it can go, or they, they decide that they want to do certain things, like that there are ways that you can get yourself out, out of that situation. You can be straight up and just say, no, this is not right. Get, let me out of the car. But if you don't want to be as confrontational, say that you feel sick, say that you want to stop and get food first, say that, um, I, I don't know, like there, there are lots of things that you can do. I got to pee. To, yeah, 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 I got to pee to just get yourself out of that, out of that situation. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Have, have like a list of, of go-tos. I really got a, a taste of like what the first responders have to go through because I, I it's always like, you don't want to think about it's in lives lost, like children and crashes and people passing away and stuff. And it just reminded me, it's like a stark reminder that um, that's what it's about. It's like, there's a time and a place. If you really want to do something like that, you can go to a track. Um, you don't need to do it uh, to get where you need to go during the day or anywhere else, because it's, it's not worth it. What are those few minutes going to do for you? Just leave early, plan accordingly and arrive alive, you know? Oh my God, I love that. Leave early. Leave an extra 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early, and then you don't have to speed, right? We have no excuse with the phones now to know how long it's going to take us. So assume traffic, assume traffic problems if you have to drive somewhere, and just check your GPS as you're coming up to the time, not when you actually get in the car. Check it an hour before check it 30 minutes before you think you need to go because the gps has helped me tremendously good point jessica any parting words i would say for me and i mean rightfully so a lot of the anti-speeding campaigns reflect you know to try to minimize that need for speed and just advocate that it's not bad and rightfully so that is something that we need to advocate but i do think something that should also be implemented is showing those opportunities where that need for speed could still be fulfilled because personally i didn't realize that there were so many organized events where you know if i did have this real need that i would be able to go and do it in a safe matter and i wonder if maybe if more young people were aware of that maybe not saying it would eliminate all of our problems because no. we need to be a little bit realistic but you know i'm sure for some people once they are aware of these opportunities you know you kind of realize that there's a time and a place for it and maybe it wouldn't happen so much on the road again not eliminating all of our issues because <laughs> no there's but a lot. You know, the other thing is about that that andy was saying there's some prestige in going to those places and winning something or um competing in something as opposed to right driving on a public highway and you know getting your speedometer up to 200 whatever it is right that's okay big deal you've got your uh, video on it um but really competing with other people who want to drive too and coming away with hey i came in third or you know uh you know i next time i'll do better um i think that sense of competition if we learn to develop that as opposed to just lording it over the roads and putting other people in danger. I think that would be a very good thing. And in those situations, you don't have to worry about losing your license, getting pulled over. Yeah, that's right. Caught, any hurting yourself, hurting anybody else. Like, yeah. Oh, you can still hurt yourself. Well, have you ever been involved in a crash, Andy? On the street? No, on the, on the track. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, yes. Not not too many, thank goodness, and nothing that really was dreadfully dreadful. But I did get trapped in a burning race car once. That was pretty scary. 
Um, oh yeah, no kidding. Got burned. But yeah, I got did burned you quite practice a bit. how to get out? I mean, we talked to oh, yeah. Okay. And yeah, it was all a very good point. Yeah. Whenever, right? Whenever we get to the racetrack and we start a series every year, they come and do an exit test in the car. So we have all of our stuff on and they time you to be less than nine seconds from to get out of the car. So to your point, yes, there's an exit test. And so that again, that's just part of the safety of an organized event, things like that. You have people, experienced people watching what you're doing and checking the cars because, you know, uh, just because you're your friends a mechanic and put the car together, you might need someone with a lot more experience to say, well, wait, hold on. If you do this differently, we'll let you run. But because you did it this way and then you go, oh, I didn't realize that. There's a lot of education that goes into these groups and a lot of young people get involved in that because they, they enjoy it. They enjoy to do this stuff. And then suddenly, once you start doing this stuff off road, meaning off, not on the streets, you get a sort of, you get a, a following and an understanding and you can then impart this knowledge to other people to say, you know, I'm having a good time with this stuff. And suddenly the romanticism of doing it on the street disappears. And you go, you know what? There's no point doing it out here because you realize that as fast as you think you're going on the street, when you compare to how fast you could go on the track and you realize like, I was really just messing around out here with extraordinary risk. Now I'm going faster, having more fun, actually learning to, you know, manage my car at proper speeds. And it no longer is the attraction for doing it on the street disappears. I've heard that from many young people who've got involved in these things, which again, it, it makes sense. But, you know, we, we need more people to, to think and try those things. Uh, as Jessica said, it may not apply to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and, but maybe we'll call this episode, take it to the track, something along that line, because really, if you want to yeah. drive at speed, you can do it, yeah. but you've got to yeah. do it in a way that doesn't yeah. put other people at risk. Well, thanks again, Andy. So appreciate your time. And uh, please keep doing all the wonderful things you're doing. And um, I will see you again, I hope at, at Lifesavers at some point in the future. Let me know if I can help in any other way. And thank you very much to all of you for having me. It's been, it's been a real pleasure, real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. Take care.